Welcome to another episode out of the blank podcast. I'm here with Mark. Hey, Robbie, how are you going? Mark, this has been a long awaited chat. I think everybody has a friend named Steve and we both share the same Steve. Uh, he's, we do. Yeah. he's the host of Spartan history, a great man, great man, man of many, um, avenues, I would say, but Mark, there's something special about you. I'm getting ready to ask what I would say defines you or what is your particular interest? So my particular interest and probably what's, uh, brought me to your attention is my undertaking in a podcast with ancient Greece. So why like steve well why ancient Sorry, greece why ancient greece so i've always been interested in history for a long time i've been studying it for probably 15 years and um for some reason every time i um let me go back to the beginning when i um i i used to study modern history mostly and um eventually i had a friend who who had been to university for quite some years and, and suggested I should be looking more into the ancient stuff and said, oh, you should start with ancient Greece. And I initially thought, well, uh, ancient history sort of sounds a bit boring, but maybe I'll give it a go one day. And eventually I did. I just, I saw um, uh, my first ancient history book on the shelf at a bookstore one day, um, Herodotus's Histories, um, which is, I guess, one of our, our first modern histories written in the Western world. And um, basically, I, I think I read that book in about two or three days, just, uh, I know it's about 600 page book. And I just, I couldn't put it down. Uh, the stories in it were just were amazing. And it had me hooked, basically. And um, I spent about a year just studying ancient Greece. And then my, my particular sort of um, well, what I did at that stage was I usually did a time period, then moved on to something else and tried to spend a year on that. But uh, I found there was like a little voice in the back of my head that kept wanting me to go back. And I just wasn't satisfied that it, I had learned enough yet. You got a better story than what I got. I came across like these books made by Graphic Universe and they were like comic style writings of all like Hercules and all these ancient folklore. It's actually where I learned about a lot about Hades and like him stealing Persephone and all these, these amazing stories that are drawn like comics. And I was like, this is a great avenue for a kid because you're now teaching them these hard kind of to understand topics. I mean, the fact that let's talk about Latin, for instance, nobody even that's a dead language. There are people that still study it, but so many people are like, I can live without it. It's like, yeah, but once that's gone, it's gone. You know, we'll be able maybe to translate it later, but how many people are going to be able to get the exact thing that they're saying? And I think that's important about history and that's an important part about folklore. But as soon as you say ancient, you immediately think dust. At least I think dust. And then nobody wants to learn that. They want something that's going to benefit in their life right now. Like nobody teaches you how to do your taxes. Nobody teaches you how to balance a checkbook. Nobody teaches all these things. I'm like, yeah, but we're still going off basic core principles when it comes to all the ancient history, all these old methods, all these folklore. We're giving personification, at least when it comes to the gods, for instance, which is my favorite part. You're giving personification to things that are around you, like being able to explain certain things. You know, you're praying to a god like Poseidon to hope that you have a good sea adventure or you're going out on a ship and you're afraid. So many people name their boat. That's a superstition that's lasted for the longest time. It's actually bad luck not to name your boat if you own one. Poseidon, for instance, God of the sea, one of my favorites. He's on a shirt that I made. I love it because you're now giving personification to a thing that seems like an uncontrollable force, I would say. You know, that's the ocean. It's something that is powerful, mystical. We understand a lot of it, but still there's a lot of it that's undiscovered. As soon as you start saying there's a God with a trident that lives out there and you pray to him, you now have a different effect when you're going out on a cruise or going on an adventure. That's where I find fascination with it because we just, we're, we're still the same, but we just translated to a new way of thinking. Like a lot of people just talk about one God instead of multiple gods. But I'm like, I don't know. To me, it's more fascinating to have multiple different avenues to talk about. Like if you're going to pray to this God for this or that God for this, or you're going on a hunt, let's pray to Artemis. I'm like, Oh, I like this. Yeah. It's very, um, and that's the biggest difference between, I think, um, now and even how the Greek gods and even other, th other religions, they became more, um, uh, you know, presented in the image of ourselves as people. But back in the ancient times, they were more the personification of something. So Poseidon was the sea 
or Aphrodite was lust. And when you read some of these ancient texts, even um, perhaps even like the Iliad, you, you sort of have to wrap your mind around that they weren't actually people in the story, but they were actual, they, it was the event itself or it was the emotion of someone that was actually a play. Yeah, it's like if you look at a lot of things that get created now, at least I think like 47 or 52 percent of the population just doesn't know what to believe in. Just is kind of unreligious back when maybe Christianity was like the top dog. Everybody was a Christian or something like that. And you had a very small few that were probably atheists or just didn't understand. Back in the day, folklore's myths, they weren't designed to scare you. They weren't designed to keep you in fear. They were designed for an imagination, a creative perspective. A lot of the stories were kind of like, men or half men like demigods for instance but they have this thing a part of them that is human and that makes them better than the gods which gives a lot of people hope and their folklore or their myths whatever you want to call it have a better story in my opinion compared to a lot of stuff like we could read today or the, a lot of the creativity there's that wonderment that magic that kind of keeps a civilization going i mean you don't have tv back then you don't have all these things that we use now that make us our lives so comfortable so you had to get creative with a lot of these stories you know yeah absolutely and I think another another big aspect is um, back in ancient times, not as many people were literate. We, we've got a much more literate society now. And some of us. Some of well, us. <laughs> yeah, to some degree anyway. And um, I mean, you, you, you've, I guess you, what you're seeing in a lot of, a lot of myths and the, and the religions back in ancient times is a, there's a lot of metaphors and there's a lot of lessons and ethics tied up in the myths themselves. Whereas I find now uh, people are sort of trying to take the myths literally or you know other other parts of religion literally when perhaps there's more of a, a a deeper meaning behind the stories well it's kind of like we're i wouldn't man this is a hard topic to talk about because i think me and you probably see on twitter is the trending topics of ancient greece and people trying to cancel all these folklores and take like these real meanings out of them and you're like what is going on like i'm sorry like like people were trying to cancel medusa or whatever that was calling a woman ugly or some type of thing they thought it was wrong because she was raped or something like that i'm like but it also is a tale like i don't believe that there was a woman with snakes for hair that could turn people into stone i don't know i don't live back then but it, it's a tale, you know, there's tales that are throughout ancient Greece, I found out that there was a tale about a, I think he was half God, or he was just a regular man, but a nymph had jumped into the water that he was swimming in, and she grabbed a hold of him, started kissing him, and then she prayed to the gods as he was trying to rip her off of him, that they wanted to be together forever. So they made him half man, half woman. And that's like, that's shit that's going on today. It's still translates to today where the society thinking of the same exact issues that we're having with today or the same exact thoughts that we're having today is just a new time. It seems like we're in like this repeat or this like lull. We are still like the technology and the things around us have advanced. To the basic core principle of a lot of things, we're still thinking kind of the same. We're still having these mentalities, these lifestyles that we live, which if you really look at the past compared to now, do you think it's any different or do you think it's just kind of the, the environment has changed? I think we have a lot of the same, um, I guess, core principles, core principles at play there. But again, we, I think people are very quick to jump to an ancient story and draw meaning out of it from our own perspective of embodied times. I mean, if you're going to go back and understand why that story was told in that time, you almost need to forget about the entire future that comes after that story is presented. Because then you start you put, putting your own modern concepts and, and ideals into interpreting what that story is supposed to be about. And again, these stories, I mean, when you, when you read through, you find that myths, there, there's many different versions of the same story. And again, we're only seeing the ones that have survived. So we don't know, we don't know how far back they really go, um, what their real origins were. We're just seeing, I guess, uh, other people's interpretation of perhaps older versions of those myths as well. It's kind of hard because like, if you look at, for instance, I think people take the Medusa one literally, and you got to understand she's been killed many times over. 
Like it's not just one story with one dude cutting off her head. We could talk about Perseus, sure. But there's plenty of times that there, someone has had to get Medusa's head for a task. You know, she keeps regenerating and come back to life. That obviously means it wasn't real. If you're getting, mo it's like a comic. There's alternate universes. Wolverine could die in one series and he's alive in the next. You know what I mean? It's this whole entire, people are kind of taking it down to the bare bones of things. And I look at it like, if anything, it's supposed to spark your interest in this topic. A lot of this stuff, this old stuff that a lot of people don't want to pick up because we're so fast paced to the future we want everything now we want to be on mars we want all these i want to be on a hotel on mars i would like to get time travel to be able to go back in time to experience a lot of these things because i feel like there's a bunch of perspectives we're missing steve uh, brought the best one up in my head when he talked about the Sp uh, spartans conquering over I, I forgot what what place he named but they conquered over like perhaps yeah, they conquered over a small town or small village, and they the Spartans slept in their homes of the people that they conquered, knowing that they, they were right there. At any moment, they could kill them, but they never even feared it because they knew how powerful they were. And I was like, I never even thought of that perspective. Imagine you're in your house trying to sleep, and you pissed off your wife or you pissed off whoever, and you're like – one eye open in case a butter knife comes in by it no none of that they were like i'm gonna sleep soundly because i literally conquered you so bad that i don't have to worry about you even raising a fist to me because you're so afraid of me i'm like i never even thought of that perspective i guarantee you there's thousands more out there that we're missing yeah and just having that that reputation too once they've established um their reputation then you know it does precede them as well and that that would that would happen later on where sparta would be recognized even going into further into history before the Greek and Persian Wars, they were um, recognized as the preeminent power in Greece, basically. Now, if you could be the son of a god or a goddess, who would you be? Come on, I know you thought about it. Um, I haven't really given a great deal of thought. <laughs> would you say Zeus? I guess, I guess you'd, just, you'd want to be a son of Zeus, wouldn't you? Because then you're, you're one of the, the more powerful gods one of the uh the olympians yeah see I, I man i'm a fan of the poseidon thing though because that leads into like the whole like merman aspect of things you could be aquaman a little bit but i think i think i don't know i just had an attraction to the sea since i was a kid you know i live in a beach town so it's constantly been around me in this type of thing and i i wouldn't consider power in the way that you would consider one of the strongest because i look at a bunch of the gods and some of the more useful ones that don't really get talked about a lot, Hephaestus, for instance, he makes the weapons, he makes all these amazing things, but people, you know, every time he's written down, he's either overweight, I think I've only read one tale where he was like a jack dude because he's working in the forges all the time, but his face is completely like singed and burned from, you know, the sparks from hitting the anvil, you know, he was just all kind of like a mechanic, I would say, like, you know, covered in grease. And I, I consider him more powerful. I think a lot of the stories get told and, you know, we all remember the Hercules movie, the Disney movie, and people are like, wait a minute, Zeus is an asshole. It's like, yeah, because it's a Disney movie. They're not going to tell you that stuff, but it sparks your interest into learning into the topic so that you can have these fantasies. You can have this idea. You can start creating visions or you can start creating a picture into your mind to be able to understand these stories, which I think is important. I mean, the best way to get people interested in history is if they can try and closely relate to it or be able to put themselves into it. And to spark a better understanding, you have to adapt it to the times that you're dealing with. And right now, we don't have anything that would be ancient or anything. I mean, if you talk about maybe a laptop that's five years old, ancient. But yes. when it comes to actual ancient times with hieroglyphs and ruins, unless it's got some mystical alien thing to it, that's why people are loving the pyramids. You're not going to get people interested into it because it's so far gone that it's like, how is this going to affect my life now? When you realize that ancient Greece, ancient Rome, whatever you want to say, there's core principles there that we're still doing today. That makes it interesting, but you have to highlight those. Absolutely. And I think they've, they've definitely got a lot of ideas. I mean, and this is when I first looked at Greece, it's like, well, what am I going to find of interest in here? But when you start reading into it, you see that so many aspects that we take for granted today began back in these times, or perhaps even further back. And we just completely miss that. I mean, when I went through school, I, I don't think we even, um, I don't think we even touched on ancient Greece when I was at school. And I sit there and look at, you know, well, this is the foundation of, of much of our society in this, you know, this snapshot of, of time.
it's kind of like um like i i agree with you on that i don't think my school really taught i actually had to take a separate course for it because it was the one i found the most interesting we actually did a i think it was one class out of the whole entire semester so that's just one day two hours of time that we spent on ancient greece and it was just a like a video they talked about a woman that had a 36 month old kid that was born at 36 months she just had it inside of her and they finally kid was born at 36 months and i was like that's fucking that's nuts to me but then they showed the ancient bull the little bull that you put people in and i was like oh my god this is horrible but it's also fascinating because they poked holes in the nose so it would whistle as the person was getting cooked inside and smoke would blow out and i'm like i know that's sick but that's really thought through like how many inventions do people go, well, it could be better if we just add this and then you get an upgrade later. It seems like they're, we're half-assing technology a little bit in a way that we're not, you know, back then at least it was better planning. It was better like a full thought idea. You know, I always talk about if I could go back in time, I would like to study Leonardo da Vinci and see him work because he was known as the unfinished creative, the unfinished inventor. None of his creations were ever finished because he believed that you could always add something to it to make it better. And that's why it was considered unfinished. And I was like, that's true. We solidify so many things, consider it done, stamp of approval and pass it on. And that ends up getting upgraded later. And it's like, if you sit there and make it amendable, make it better to understand, make it upgradable, for instance, like we do have things, even though they got to take some stuff out to upgrade it. If you sit there and marinate, like for a tattoo, for instance, you wait six months or you wait a little while to be able to understand if that's what you really want. Or you get hammered in a one night thing and go out and get a tattoo of like, I don't know, YOLO on your face, but you still should think about it. You should have more time and effort into things. But right now in this time that we're in, it's all about creating. It's all about putting out content. It's all about all these things and fast pacing everything because you feel like you're running out of time and you realize time is just a construct. Time is whatever you make it, whatever you consider a benefit, studying ancient Greece, studying this. You're not wrong. You're a hundred percent right in doing so. If you're interested in something, why would you waste a minute not studying or getting involved into whatever you're interested in absolutely and i wish i wish um i mean i'm in my late 30s now but i wish i'd started doing this. <laughs> i wish i'd started doing this back in um my early 20s i mean uh, i look at the amount of time i wasted and once you actually you find your passion and then you you just go full bore into it you, you look back and you go what the hell was i doing before this and you just realize the amount of missed opportunities you had. But again, you don't want to dwell on that. You just want to go, right, well, this is where I am now. And so I'm going to make the most of it. I would love to go back in time because I think one topic that really gets my interest besides ancient Greece is the fact of like mental health, for instance. And I, would, I want to see if these people suffered like we suffer today, or is this all a construct of everything that we've created that's made us like this? Back then, it seemed like people... I don't, I, there probably weren't a lot of people maybe hurting themselves or getting into this depressive slump, even though it seems like, how did they pass the time? It's like, I don't know, chuck a rock at a wall. That's pretty fun. If you've ever tried it, like it's an interesting thing to do. But now if we don't have four games running on a phone, if we don't have our Xbox on watching Hulu, if we're not doing like 30 different things at once, then we're bored. And I want to go back and see if it was really like that back then, if they had to be doing multiple tasks, was it always like, I'm waiting for the next hunt because that gives me a chance to get this release. I want to know if that was an issue back then, because from what I've seen and from what I've read and from what I've learned from the history, there wasn't a lot of people that were hitting these suicidal peaks. There's a lot, there wasn't a lot of this issue, which makes it seem like maybe we missed a step in our evolution. We consider ourselves evolved, sure, technology-wise and maybe thought-provoking-wise, we're not murdering our kids. But at the same time, seems like we missed a step because the mental health issue has rapidly increased and actually probably became more known than it was back in the day. Yeah, and I wonder, I mean, again, we don't, it's hard to tell because we don't know if that's something that would have been reported normally or whatever survives. But I think you're right. Something is definitely missing. I mean, we go back to in the old time, in ancient times, you've got people that are, I believe, are far smarter than what we are today with the, the knowledge with geometry or whatever else. You look at structures that they made and how precise they were and the tools they had to work with. Most of it had to come from, their own brains to to work a lot of these things out whereas i think now even down to the average person we we outsource a lot of our thinking 
we've got computers, we've got cal you know calculators, phones, we've got all this technology that does the thinking for us now. And it's almost taken that step away where we, we just don't exercise our brains as much as we used to. I will put all my chips in on the table that if you walk up to a random person on the street and say, what's 42 times 86, they'll pull out their phone and they'll look for the calculator. Back then, you used to have to rattle that stuff off. You used to have to think, which is interesting because in our creativity, for instance, the creativity back then, I don't know how obsessed you are with the statues. I don't know why every single one of them are ripped. It, that's nuts to me. I mean, I get it. It's like, that's the Abercrombie and Finch model. Sure. But still, they're like, you look at one of those old statues, the creativity in the time. How many people now can do that with uh, with statues, with carvings? How many people can chisel that out of marble? Maybe it just adapted to a new form. It seems like people are very good at video editing now. People are very good at using technology in a way. The creativity has now adapted into a new form. I think that's important that you adapt to the new form, but also there's some basic necessities of art that might never, ever stay alive anymore you know latin's considered a dead language how many more things are going to be considered dead you know these are very very small avenues that people are interested in now i have talked to a few masons that you know sculpt and do all these things and like i'm the only one in my whole entire state and i'm like you're probably the only one in half the country man to be 100 percent honest with you it's not an easy tool it's a lot of people want to be able to have ease of access and creativity but when you have to go to a store and get marble you have to do all these things that aren't really being sold on the side of the road anymore or sold at a market it's very very difficult for you to be able to consume your craft which kind of deters people from getting interested into it yeah it does and i mean and there's a difference too with i guess people being disengaged or like we talk about even with technology you've got someone who does video editing or, or whatever else they've got an interest there they've got a drive they've got a purpose whereas and same thing with in ancient times you've got people with art forms but i think there's a big uh, another big difference where i think people aren't as engaged in the society that they they're a part of whether that's they just don't feel like they belong or there's no clear direction that's that's given i mean has society become too large and people are just uh, lost in their way. So there's, you know, there's definitely a few aspects that have have gone missing somewhere along the lines as we've progressed in time. You would think that if your community got bigger and you kind of had to see people on a daily basis, you would become more connected to the people around you. But it's actually made us more isolated. You know, back in the day, small populations of cities and all these things, you had so much open space, you really didn't have to come across anybody, but people did anyway, people communicated, people talked, you talk to the people in your civilization, you talk to people in your village, you talk to your neighbors. Nowadays, it's very, very difficult for people to be able to talk to other people because we're so, I guess, in our own heads about things, you know, you see on Twitter, so many people coming across saying, I'm a philosopher. I'm like, are you really though? Because you don't strike me as a Socrates. You don't strike me as any of these people. You strike me as a person that can rattle off a couple of things that they heard on Twitter. How much of your own thoughts are your own or something that someone or something you've read somewhere? Precisely. And how much of it is opinion that you just won't be swayed from? And that, that idea too. I mean, I don't, have you read um, Sapiens? I think it's by... Um, if it's not a movie Ferrari? or if it's no, not a it's, documentary, it's a I have... I, have I, then I, don't, I don't read, bro. No. What are you talking about? <laughs> well, he puts forward the idea how, um, so basically, uh, Homo sapiens, our, ourselves, basically, we can, we can conjure up about 150 meaningful relationships, personal relationships, one-on-one. -on -one. Um, once we get past that, it becomes quite difficult to keep a stabilized society with that sort of uh, cooperation going on. And that's why the theories put forward that we've developed these abstract ideas that connect us together. So... Yeah, you know, if I live in, in Australia, I've got then someone I've never met who is on the other side of the country, and we can find some common ground because we we've got the same nationality. And it's but it's it's really like an abstract idea. It's not so much a a um a personal bond or relationship that's been formed. Well, it's kind of like sports talk. Whenever you see somebody wearing the same football jersey as your favorite team or something, you, every time you meet that person, you always have a sports talk. Because that's the only thing you've been able to connect over and the conversation doesn't evolve from there because when the conversation does evolve from there, you realize you have nothing in common with this person. It's very, very hard to communicate. I think communication skill is probably the weakest one in today's times because you don't really need to do it to survive anymore. 
back in the day, you had to use communication to survive. You don't want to piss off your neighbor. You don't want to say the wrong thing. You want to settle disputes and you want to get things working, get a civilization building. You know, we don't have to build houses anymore. That's not a basic skill anymore. We have people that do that for us. We hire a company to be able to do that for us. But was it the factor of art that kept people so calm and so peaceful or we're, are we missing that today? Because I don't see a lot of art in my town. I don't see any national landmarks or giant things that would seem as a, I, I consider it therapy. Everything is just a building. It looks exactly like the building beside it. People keep up into their homes, use their four walls to guard them off from everything around them. Man, maybe that's where the depression starts. Maybe that lack of communication, that lack of connection, that lack of empathy. Once you lose touch with that, it's kind of gone. And it's very, very hard to get back. But back in the day, people can say they're savages, they're barbarians, but they they cared about their, their, their family. They cared about the people that were in their area. Anything that they did, any horrible act was a punishment because you were seen as striking and hurting the family. Criminals, for instance, putting somebody in a bull, maybe it was wrongdoing. 100% it could be wrongdoing. You, a lot of people didn't really give a shit. But if you tell a bunch of people that this person just stole a bunch of stuff and made your whole market collapse or all these things that are going to threaten your life, you immediately think you're threatening me means you're threatening my family means you're threatening the home that I live in. And that's why people were so appraising to have these things. And these acts were done in public, not only to deter people from doing so, but to understand the fact that you are messing with the community not just one person. You might steal from that one person, but you're messing with the community as a whole. Now, if whatever, somebody's not wearing a mask or having a social gathering party that's above 10 people in your neighbor's house, you call the cops on them. You're more than willing to throw them under the bus, not because you, in, not because whatever, it's because you, you want rules to be followed. The whole programmed mindset has completely changed from back in the day. Yeah, and I mean, and back to, um, the communication part. I mean, a, and a large aspect of being able to communicate effectively is being able to listen to someone else and actually know what they're trying to say. Otherwise, all you're going to be putting across is your your current thought and opinion without any regard to what they were trying to engage you with. And and I think a lot of that is happening. I mean, you see that. I think you see that on Twitter. You see echo chambers formed because people just have their own ideas. They're not really listening to what someone else is saying, and they just keep keep um, reposting whatever their, their current idea is. You can only truly know everything when you admit that you know nothing. Yeah, I it's, think that's what uh, Socrates said. I, I guess that could be Socrates. Yeah. I thought, I was thinking about well, it. I was along, like, along those lines, he, he said something similar where- I adapted he, it. He knows as he knows nothing. Yeah, I think that's important because I started to learn from when, at least when I was young, I'm only 23, but when I was a kid, before I started this podcast, I thought I knew so much. And now it's like whenever a topic gets brought up or something, I've talked to someone that I've had a conversation with about that topic, and I know some things, but I never admit that I'm 100% right. I never say that this is the only perspective, because once you start understanding perspectives, you start to realize there's more and there's information that's locked to you. There's so much of it that's not there that we don't even understand. There's pieces of ancient Greece or things that we might not find until 200 years from now. You might have a solidified opinion. And this is when I get a little upset with PhDs, for instance. Some people like to consider that whatever they studied or whatever they researched for 30 something years is 100% fact. It's not wrong, but also if your PhD or your thesis gets proven wrong, you shouldn't look at it as a slight onto you. You should look at it as a benefit to the craft, a better understanding of what's going on. That's why it's so hard for people like um, Avi Loeb. I don't know if you know who that is. He's a popular astrophysicist, but he was studying a comet and he was about to prove all these scientists wrong. And all these scientists teamed up because their 35 years of work was about to be flushed down the toilet because some dude was about to blow everything out of the water because they were all wrong and he was right. And they were fighting him and trying to make him look bad on the social media, but he didn't have social media to protect himself. And you look at that. As a society, are we shooting ourselves in our own foot and never progressing on the fact that we don't ever want to be proven wrong? We don't want all our work to be tossed down the toilet. Instead of thinking in that mindset, shouldn't we think in the mindset that we're going to benefit the society that we live in? We're going to enhance our growth as people, a human species that is trying to survive on this floating rock through space. It, that's how I like to think of it, because I think it changes the script on a lot of the way the public thinks. People look at a certain comment look at a certain thing, a message, whatever. 
And you can take that multiple ways. When I messaged you saying, I was just giving you a heads up so we can roll right into it. Somebody could have taken that the wrong way and been like, what do you mean? And, and, and just gone a whole different route with it. But you understood what I was saying. You understood I might come off as an asshole, but I'm not. And now we lead to this conversation. There are so many missed opportunities, all because people can't take down their own narrative to be able to understand someone's own perspective. Exactly. And I mean, when you look at history or archaeology, what a silly discipline to, to build a a preformed idea that you're just not going to budge from because i mean i think they say like you know especially in archaeology one turn of the shovel can prove a, an entire theory wrong and i mean you get you get so many so many dogmas that do form and people just don't want to deviate i mean i don't know if you're aware of um graham hancock and yeah. the stuff that he writes i mean Trevor Carls. yeah and there's some um there's some ideas that are, I, I admit i'm a bit I'm not so sure about it, but he does bring up some excellent points. And he, and he goes through the history of how certain dogmas have been unraveled and people have been forced to then concede and go, oh, maybe there, this, you know, this civilization is a bit older than we thought. But then they, it's almost like they, we're going to go and make that, that far, though. We're not going to continue going back. It's, well, how about we just be open to the possibility that, that things may be very different to what we believe they are now? Well, how many things can you rip up of the past and totally delete from our history? Instead of remembering them, we were more in tune with deleting it and trying to forget it all. But once you forget it, how long until you repeat it? Like, how many things are we doing that we thought, like, for instance, the pandemic is the best example. We experienced this a couple hundred years ago with the Black Death, that whole plague that went all, all across the land. Our reaction, because we hadn't experienced something like that in a couple hundred years, was exactly the same as what they did back in the day. It's, it relates so much to the same methods we're trying to be able to handle it. People getting locked inside of their homes, people doing all these things. It's just a different time. It's just a different disease, but we handle it the same way. So I look at this like, are we going to remember this or are we going to write this down and record this for people a couple hundred years from now that might experience the same thing to not make the same mistakes that we took, not take the same path that we took to be able to learn from it, recover better from it, where it's not a full fucking year. And so we're, and we're still going through it a little bit. My town just lifted masks. It's, it's this whole entire thing of society is repeating itself in this lull. I don't know if you've, uh, if you have Netflix, but there's a movie on there um, with Batista. It's a new zombie movie. I think it's called Living Dead or something like that. It takes place at a casino. But the dude's trying to break into this bank vault. And he looks over and sees these skeletons. He goes, how many times are we just in like a, a repeat? Is this just a loop? How many times have we been here? And he looks down and the dude that's laying on the ground is wearing the same exact uniform as he's wearing. And it looks like exactly like his skeleton. He goes, how many times have we been in here doing the same thing? And how many times have we failed? And it wasn't real, but it, the way he said it and the way it, it just hits you in that moment, it's like, how many times have we repeated the same exact shit? History does repeat itself. History is the best predictor of the future, but people are more than willing to forget the, the past to try and progress to the future. But all you're doing is disabling it, and then you're going to end up repeating it again. How many times has this happened over and over and over again? Is there another timeline where me and you, Mark, have just sat with a messenger pigeon and toss them back and forth in this conversation instead of taking an hour as long has like lasted 10 years i have no clue but to say that it is impossible to say that there wasn't a scenario or there wasn't something in the past that relates to similar to what we're doing now being able to communicate it's just taking a new form we're repeating the exact same steps as what they did back in the day instead of using horse to be able to travel with message we now have phones the technology has evolved but how long until that reset happens and we end up repeating the same exact line but we have no pathway no guideline no template to be able to study to make sure we don't make the same mistakes and lead to the same inevitable collapse exactly it's um it's almost yeah the, the lesson's been learned but then we we forget it we we don't look back to to the past and uh, i mean it's almost like we, we look back at the past and we think oh no because we've, we've progressed through time so we must have become smarter so the ideas back in the past they're not relevant today but you know, flat Earth. Very... We still think the Earth is flat. There's people. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll bring you back to I'll bring you back to an ancient Greek um, example here. With um, Herodotus is often called the father of lies, but um, he brings up a he talks about uh, when Xerxes invades Greece, 
um, in the in the second invasion of Greece. And he brings his massive army and fleet over. And before before the fleet arrives um, north of Greece, out of the um, Chalcidides, like there's three, uh, uh, Chersonese, sorry, there's three like fingers that stick down from the north of Greece. And in the first um, peninsula, um, Herodotus talks about how he had a canal cut through about, I think it's about a, a mile length of that, of that peninsula. And he describes how the workers cut it on different angles. So, you know, he sort of goes into a lot of the details on how it was cut. And then basically Xerxes' navy would sail through there. And the, the, the reason for it was uh, earlier, um, some 10 years earlier, a fleet that the Persians sent was wrecked off the, the coast there at the mountain. So he was trying to avoid having to go past it again. Anyway, people have, back in um, time, people have thought, well, this is a load of rubbish. There's no way the ancients would have been able to build this in that amount of time. And I think it was maybe the 70s or 80s where they finally, they flew some geo-surveying aircraft over, over that um, bit of land. And there was always like a little sunken area in, the, in that area. And they, they basically discovered under the, under the earth there, there was actually an ancient canal that had been cut on the angles that Herodotus describes. And, but people have for thousands of years had basically dismissed the story as just a, a tale. It's interesting because um, my buddy, he, he's a paleontologist. He went down to the mammoth tar pits and he was talking about how like all these mammoths, so many of them would just be like grazing on something, end up walking off this edge part right here and then get stuck in tar and then die. And I look at it like you see fossilized remains of mammoths. You see dinosaur bones that were able to dig up. How long in the future until they're digging up old laptops, but we don't have the power to understand electricity anymore. So they're just like, what are these ancient things? What is this tablet? There's no way to turn it on. There's no way to do anything. It's this understanding of, I think time ends up repeating itself. I think there's many possible scenarios. We're just doing the same exact thing as our ancestors were doing, just in a new form. I want to make sure there's a logbook. That's why I think philosophers and people that write this stuff down give credit to whoever was like, should we be logging this? I give that guy so much credit, whoever said that. But here's the weird part about, we could talk about this being a log. We can talk about the internet. All these things can be a log, information, newspapers, whatever. But sadly, when it comes to the actual history, it has changed. Recording the data has changed. Recording data now is whatever bias you have. You can write it in whatever narrative you want. I can Google an article right now. That could be what happens if I eat two things of Raisin Bran, which I've done and I've Googled. And let me tell you, the first result is WebMD telling you you have stomach cancer. Yeah, so, that's just every result, isn't it? So it's like, what do you do at this point? When you look at the recorded history, that's why when people take an article and they run with it, instead of looking at it and running with it, considering it fact or published, journalism is gone. I've talked to plenty of journalists to say everybody's a journalist. I'm like, what do you mean? You write a blog, you're a fucking journalist. Someone's going to come across that and be able to create whatever narrative or take whatever narrative from that. I could write monkeys fart through their mouths. And then some person might see that and be like, I knew it. And it's like, it, 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 how malleable are you? But at the same time, the bias of information, we're now instead of wanting to get the truth, it's now about everyone's opinion matters, which is important too. But when it comes to trying to be able to progress the species as a human race, we keep shooting ourselves in the foot when it comes to finding out correct information. If it doesn't fit our narrative, we don't have to believe in it. And I'm like, okay, but wouldn't you rather want to try and find an answer? But people like that mystery narrative. People like being attached to the. I think there's another answer. Yeah, we should look for it. But at the same time, if it fits right now, we should probably run with it just so we can actually try and progress ourselves a little bit. And when we have better tools and better time, we can understand it better. Back in the day, they knew that when one person had an idea or an invention, it got implemented if it was good enough and they ran with it and it didn't get adapted or changed until later. But I mean, we're in this world of creativity, right? how much of this creativity is actually creative or just a piece of information or an add-on to someone else's idea. There's no basic core principles. We we're trying to go to another planet in fear that this one's going to run out of water. 75% of the damn thing is water, but they're like, there's salt in it. Find a way to get the salt out. Is that, does that seem harder than going to Mars? 
like that's what gets me i'm like hang on a second can we what what are we doing is it because mars seems cool i don't know but the ocean seems cool too right i would like to discover atlantis if it exists yeah that's that's a big question too but um yeah and getting back to um to i said a lot now you know what i mean by no script yeah (laughs) um yeah, well, I'm sorry. Yeah, move on to Atlantis. I mean, there's so many, so many theories that, that are abound about Atlantis. I mean, and again, I've seen this. On, this this is blown up on Twitter as well, where you know people suggest, oh, it's it's all just, it's just a, a mind experiment through Plato. And you go, okay, but um, you know, it may well could be. But there's, I mean, it's just about being open to the possibility that there may be more than what we know right now. I mean, I find it particularly interesting that, um, I think when you look through the story of Plato. Um, supposedly Atlantis was meant to have sunk, I think, in um, 9,600 BC because Solon went and visited uh, the Egyptian priests. They told him the story. So that was, that was around 600 BC. They've told him that Atlantis disappeared 9,000 years ago. And then you look at the ice core samples that uh, they came out in Greenland, which look at the, I think they call it um, Meltwater Pulse 1B or something like that. There's a couple of stages where the Earth's um, sea levels rose dramatically. And I think it's in that second, that level 1B, where the, the st- that time frame that's given in, in Plato's dialogue is fits smack bang into that, that point on the, the ice core sample when sea levels were meant to have risen. There's, so um, you look at that and you think, hmm, is there something some, else there? There's um, off the coast of Japan, they found underwater pyramids and they're wondering how people could build them underwater. And I'm like, is it more possible that there was an earthquake that happened and no one was around to be able to see that place sink underwater? I don't think there's possible or there's a type of scenario where there's an underwater civilization unless it's sunk. It used to be on land and somehow with all I mean, we we have earthquakes all the time. To think that there isn't one spot that gets permanently affected or sinks underwater is kind of crazy. I mean, they talk about seeing erosion uh, markings on the Sphinx. Graham Hancock was talking about that, how there used to be water in Egypt. Yeah, that's probably the, that's a very likely scenario. It just sunk down. I mean, if you look at the altitude level, it's lower altitude. They're lower down when you go down into like Egypt. It's a little bit lower to think that it, at one point an earthquake happened and it just sunk down a little bit or something happened and the water just ended up going somewhere else and turns into this dry wasteland. There's so many factors that come into play. And I think a lot of stuff happens that we don't really realize has an effect to it. We have a storm that happens. Okay. Um, storm happened, but my house is fine. Okay. But what is being affected though? Is it the water being affected? I live in a beach town. If you get any cars around here, you're having salt water issues in your car. That's why when people buy a car around here, they go like where there's not any salt water. They try and go farther, closer west as possible. I'm on the East Coast. So they try and go the, a little bit more inwards into the country because every car around here that you're going to buy is going to have salt water damage on it. What happens is when it rains, picks up a lot of the ocean water and moves it over onto the land a little bit. So people's cars are being soaked. Eventually it's going to cause rust. Eventually it's going to tear up your vehicle or it's not going to run anymore. People don't think of the long game. They only think of the thing that's right in front of them. And I'm like, what's the long game on a lot of this stuff. There's so much at play that's now affecting us now. It's like, well, what do you mean by long game? Well, shit, that's happened like 2000 something years ago too. You got to think that a long game has got to end up coming a little bit closer in our lifetime than it is, you know, back in the day. Yeah. And I mean, you can get back to the sunken cities. I mean, it's, I guess nothing like earthquakes don't even need to explain it. It's if, if you've got, I mean, they've proven that sea levels have risen dramatically, but it's, if you accept that perhaps there could have been cities further back than what most people decide to accept, where, where would major populations be building usually on the coastlines Real, you know the mouths of rivers and this is where we find you know our most densely populated cities today and so if if sea levels rose at, you know a couple of hundred feet or or whatever they're, they're going to be the first to disappear aren't they how long until there's only a few countries left because the rest of the place is underwater potentially i've, I've read i've read um books on like the cycles of how how earth has gone over the years where you know, the sea levels rise, but then they, they you know, the, the ice caps build up again and 
more lands revealed and we seem to go through cycles that just over i mean for us it's it's we can't notice it but you know it's it's you're talking about millions of years where more land forms the the, the continents move around they they create new land masses and it just seems to be a, a constant story like the i guess mean, that's the main the main thing with with earth nothing is fixed in place everything is constantly moving how long do you think until this place is able to reset do you think that there's going to be a reset that comes into the future like a kind of a, a reawakening of a lot of things i feel like at one point it's kind of like if you put a full glass of water and then you add ice cubes to it eventually when those ice cubes melt the water level is going to rise you're gonna to have to take a sip right so how long until it ends up resetting? I feel like Earth has reset plenty of times. You know, there's been these global extinctions and these colossal periods that have changed. When's the next one approaching? You know, when is it when is it enough? And is it going to be better or are we going to repeat the same things over again? Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's that's the big question. Who knows? I mean, I think scientists believe that it's nothing's going to happen within our lifetime or, you know, children's lifetime or, you know, way off in the history but again who knows something just from left field may may happen and and trigger a reset we just don't know and also when it comes to the myths for instance how long until we find this kraken man i'm trying to figure out if that guy was on drugs when they were creating that because i'm like how they had to see something that looked like that right like they had to see, you you pull inspiration from things that you've seen even in your dreams for instance your brain can't create new faces they take bits and pieces of faces that you've seen and add them up into one thing like for instance the werewolf that wasn't just a random idea somebody had a dude took that inspiration that he got from a dream because his brain was adding a bear and a wolf together and turned into this man beast thing that was also part man. So you can't create new faces in your dreams. Your brain only adds bits and pieces of things that it's seen, faces that you probably don't even really remember. Just subconsciously, they're stored in there. So I'm wondering where the Kraken thing came from. How did you picture this giant sea monster that comes out of the water? It can't be new. It's just bits and pieces of something that you've seen. Yeah, I mean, it has someone seen something that wasn't so spectacular, but then the story gets retold and retold and retold generation after generation where it starts turning into something else. It's, um, I think that's where a lot of these sort of monstrous myths, but then they, they also come to embody, I guess, certain archetypes, um, fears and, and whatever else, I guess, when you're out on the sea. I mean, and they, these stories become a lot more mythical over time, I think. But then no one's actually seen it themselves. It was someone who who saw it, who, you know, someone's <laughs> grandfather's friend. Or yeah, I heard like a story that. from a guy who knew a guy whose cousin knew a guy, and it's like, okay, all right, that sounds interesting to me. I think um, what I always found fascinating was this giant, like when they talk about there's the Mariana Trench, and there's a there's a thing known as a blip, which is like a, it's it's actually called the bloop which is like this one sound that it makes that nobody can figure out what it's coming from. Nobody can discover what the source of the sound is, but there's just this bloop that they get on this radar and they don't know where it comes from. It's just this unknown thing that hasn't been able to be explained. Even still today, people, you know, we don't really have the technology to go down there and figure it out. We can scan and hear the sound of it, but we can't be able to go down there and find out what the source is. I'm wondering if there's like, that scene from Clash of the Titans or whatever, where Hades goes underwater and opens up that crack of the ground and this crack and comes out. I'm like, is that it? Like that, to think that that's not a possibility that there's something down there and this giant trench or this hole in the earth that leads to something bigger, some type of thing that might be lying dormant. I like to think of that possibility. I like to think that that came from somewhere. You know, that's just not, that, that can't be an idea that was just fabricated. People have to start with a story and then evolve it from there. Yes, or some some energy, some built up energies down down in the depths. I mean, we we and again we we don't know what's you know how far into the earth have we explored? How far down? What do we truly know? What's what's down there? And how do we know if Hades was the bad guy? We just read stories, but how many stories do we see today where it's like that's not the truth? That's that sounds like malarkey. Maybe that's what happened with Hades. It's kind of like when I say Alex Jones, people are like, oh my god, and they eye roll. The media made him look bad. The media made him look like this conspiracy nut. Maybe Hades is that way. Maybe Hades is a nice guy. You get to hell and Hades is like, what's up, man? You want to play like checkers or something? You're like, what? I thought you were going to like kill me and throw me up on a wall. Absolutely. I mean, and in, in the myths too, you, you read he's not, when you look at popular culture in the movies, he's presented as, you know, 
too much of our notion of hell is is built up with Hades. I mean, Hades was never never supposed to be, you know, it, it, eternal torment or punishment. It was just that's where everyone went. If you died, you went to Hades. It was a place of almost nothingness. And he got screwed yeah. in the deal with the gods when they split up the powers. Yeah, absolutely. So really, I mean, you're harboring resentment. The fact that he got screwed over, that no wonder he's probably a bad guy from what people have heard. You'd be pissed off too if all you had to smell was death. You ever smelled death before? It's not a good smell. It smells like an old folks home. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, at least he got um, Persephone for six months of the year. But um, anyway. Yeah, I mean, I guess you need that break for the other six months, <laughs> right? <laughs> After a while, you're like, oh my God, just send her on vacation, go to Tahiti or something. But I think it's important to bring that up because my energy on the world, for instance, is, or my idea of energy for the world is, I think that people give off a certain energy. There's a positive and there's a negative one. And the world has run on this negative energy for so long. It's kind of like Hades in Clash of the um, Titans. When he walks into the gods thing, he's all covered in ash and black smoke. And he goes, you've learned to live off their, your, their admiration, their love, which is power was powered you. I've learned to pray off their fear. It's still energy, but it's a diminished form of it. I've learned to prey on that. And you see, he was weaker than the gods. But who was the last one standing in Wrath of the Titans? He was. He gave his power to Zeus in that movie because their power, the people have forgotten about the gods. They have stopped caring about them. They've started to hate them and take down everything that they had where their power was starting to go. But Hades learned to live off their fear, their hate, all these little types of things. And he was able to share part of his energy. I look at that like, would the world be running a lot better on positive energy? Would it, would it be a healthier earth? Would it be more sustainable? Or has it just been running on so much bad energy for so long? This is the product that we get from it. Absolutely. I mean, it's again, obviously ne negative negativity is just going to breed more negativity. And this kind of brings it back to what you were saying earlier. It's why are we, were we happier when we, we did live in smaller communities? Was it, was it because we only we were only aware of what was happening around us in our communities that affected our daily lives. Whereas now we're so connected to anything that's going on in the world, any bad news, we, we're completely aware of it. We just seem to be bombarded with uh, traumatic things happening everywhere. I mean, at what extent, I mean, obviously it's bad for, for wars to take place, famine, whatever else, but how much can you expect one person to, to really take and really, I mean, for a bit, lack of a better word, care about. I mean, where does it where does it stop um, draining you? It's like Atlas holding up the weight of the world on his shoulders. Yeah, exactly. He can handle the weight because he's been used to it. But then, if you add a rock on top of that, you add any type of weight on that, he notices the change. And right now, we we can handle so much, but eventually, that our backs are going to break. You know, we're going to fall. I'm just hoping it's we realize it sooner rather than later. It seems like a lot of the world right now is completely divided. And I don't think it's because of our own doing. I think it's because of higher powers that have this more, I, I guess, I'd say to lack of a better word, more power than we do. They have more of an influence into society. It seems like I always talk about like an Illuminati. I'm not like I to think that that's wrong. I don't consider that wrong, but I think there's people that are able to manipulate people's minds very easily with the controls of how many tentacles they have in the media and all these different things that kind of sway people's thoughts and perspectives of things. How many of your thoughts are your own? I've been asking that question so much when I sit here and I talk to you about everything I've talked about. Are these my own thoughts or these information that I picked up along the way? Because I could tell you the Robbie thought is the one that's wondering if I uh, stick my leg up higher than my other leg, I can fart differently. That's my own thought. I know for a fact that's my own thought. But there's so much of stuff when it comes to like issues in the government, issues with corruption, issues in the world. There's stuff that's been shown to me, stuff that my brain has picked up and things that I've started to get interested in. Those aren't my own perspectives. How much of this hatred that we have amongst each other is really our own or just some bigger force at play trying to pin us against each other because the fear of us being together is what is really scary. The fear that we can all come together and overthrow these things that are controlling us, these things that are trying to keep us in a peg system. Same thing back in the day when they had the king. The king ruled in fear. The king had power, and power is corrupt. So it's very, very hard when the people came together and they threw over the king. They threw over these giant tyrants. They understood that there was this force that was pinning them all against each other, and they wanted to be free. Freedom is this last drink, this chalice of life that gets brought to you. 
but we're more than happy to fight the people that we care about that we're supposed to love on the factor of they might not agree with the way that we've been told to agree. And it's interesting to me. I always like to look at that perspective of things. I wonder why am I so pissed off sometimes at some people? Why is this? Am I really mad at them or am I mad at a bigger thing or something pitting me against this person? It's interesting to think about when you really examine the whole thing, but also you got to be careful because you'll grow white hair. I have white hair right now from in my chin hair. So I'm like, I'm stressing <laughs> too hard on this stuff. And I mean, and this is, this is how I guess democracy came about too was, I mean, you had back in, go back to so ancient Greece, you had um, the aristocracy and they, they basically ran, I mean, before that you had Kings, but it turned up into an aristocracy where you had the well-born they controlled basically all parts of society. And then eventually you started seeing people were getting enough of, you know, having enough of this, they had no say politically, they were had to do what they were told to do. And I think it may have, this is what it gives birth to the tyrant. And this is, was an invention, I guess, in, in ancient Greece and where the word comes from is it's almost like one of these um, noblemen that were part of the aristocracy saw an opportunity because if he could get all the people on his side, he could take power for himself. And this is what did develop in a lot of city states in Greece, where you had the tyrant, he was backed by popular support and would take take power. Now, in those in those days, the, the word tyrant, it didn't have a negative connotation as as it does today as much. But um, it basically just meant someone who gained power through through other means, less legitimate means. And Eventually, they, I mean, these tyrants would end up starting acting, acting like kings and whatever else. And you would start to see kind of a seesaw where a tyrant would, would take power, then they would be tossed out because they'd only last for maybe a generation or two because then they, their sons would get installed and then uh, they would, they would, you'd see the whole power level collapse. Then the aristocracy would come back and they would try and uh, reform the, the systems a little bit, but it wouldn't be never be enough. So another tyrant would take the opportunity. And this is where you see slow concessions that start leading to um, parts in, especially in the Athenian society, where democracy would start developing. Democracy was never like a one idea where someone said, oh, "This is this would be a great idea. Let's let's govern this way." It was built over many generations, and it was usually through a power struggle. It's crazy when you start to realize that when power corrupts someone, and you're not doing what they want you to do anymore. It becomes this system of fuck you, pay me. Everything nowadays is fuck you, pay me. And you're like, well, I thought we, we were supposed to care about our fellow man. No, 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 no. That's what we told you. What it is now is fuck you, pay me. And you're like, oh my God, I can't even, I can't do anything because now you have all the power. I have no chips. And I think this is where people are coming to grips with it. Just like how I just explained people are starting to realize that they don't have as much influence into their own life as they thought they did. They're starting to realize there's a bigger force at play. They're starting to realize that, okay, I just sat in my house because someone told me that we were going to be doing it for two weeks and it's been a year. How much of my own life and how much control do I have? Or is there just something going against me? Am I going to be arrested for not following protocols? Am I going to be arrested? Is my life going to be ruined all because I don't do exactly what you say? This is where people get scared and this is where people fight with other people is because they in the fear that they're going to lose what they have to be able to do in their life. And I think this is not a time to be divided. This is a time to stand together. You know, when it comes to peaceful actions, create resolutions. It's 100% true. But people feel like they've been peaceful for so long. And now they're waking up to this thing that they have to act in the worst and dramatic ways possible, which is tearing up anything they possibly can tear up. And I think this is where our, our vision gets lost. The true goal gets lost because when you're acting out of passion rather than acting out of thought, someone can just throw one thing in your face. Well, what about this? And then you run down that avenue and tear up something with, that's just dividing your attention. It's very hard to stay focused when you're acting out of anger, but it's much more easier to stay focused when you're thinking clear and you're acting out of the passion for whatever you're trying to fight for. And I think, and many of these things have been in play for, for since society's been around. I think no matter, like, even if we look at the issues of what's affecting today with, you know, the lockdowns or whatever else, but you've got, as societies develop, you need it. You need productive, a productive population to continue to grow that society. And so what happens along the way is, I mean, you look at the education system that's built. So you become a functional member of society. It doesn't it benefit you. 
doesn't you well it doesn't benefit you personally though how like you know on a personal level what does the education do for you it just allows you to to, con- to contribute and perform a role in society or um i mean even even di- nutrition these days or diet it's it's all done because it's much cheaper and you can feed a larger population with agriculture, whereas perhaps we're not getting the nutrients that we're used to. And so for the individual, I mean, again, this is not like a you just tear down the whole machine because society will collapse. But it's almost like we're taking a path where we're doing what's best for society at the detriment to what's good for the individual. It's hard not to be selfish in a world that's trying to seem or it seems like it's taking everything from you. And try and hold on to every last bastion of life that you have left to make sure that your thoughts are still your own thoughts and your life is still your own. But how much of it is it really? How much are you willing to sacrifice? How much are you willing to let side before you act out and you want to take something from somebody else that feels like they have more than you? It's a very, very weird world that we're living in. It's very, very strange times. But to say that it's any different than what it was back in the day, no. I think the tools just evolved. I think new things are coming into part that are playing new influences into our life. But if these new tools that are supposed to make our life easier didn't spread us apart even more. Maybe we'd have a better understanding and more of a a, a clear critical thinking mindset. You know, back in the day, philosophers were just critical thinkers. Now everyone's considering themselves a philosopher, but I don't see anybody being a critical thinker. I don't see anybody thinking at the cause and and also the effect. Most people just want an answer or most people want a solution, a band-aid to a problem. And I say, no, you have to understand that there's going to be a scar. Whatever you just did, whatever action you did that got you hurt is going to have a scar to it. That scar is not going to go away. It's going to be there forever for you. And I think the important part is not trying to find a way to fix that to make sure the scar doesn't show. But it's supposed to wear it on your sleeve as an understanding and a remembrance of something that you did that you probably shouldn't have. Absolutely. And I mean, people that claim themselves to be philosophers, it's almost like they're attaching themselves to an idea and they just run with it. It's already fully formed. They don't have to really do any work with their own mental gymnastics or, or reconcile anything themselves. But I mean, you, it was quite common. I mean, you look in, in like ancient Greece, you have Socrates. He and uh, Plato was his pupil. He, he, he comes out and he, he thinks, I mean, Socrates didn't leave any writings himself, but there seems to be a change in how these philosophers, even though they, they, talk, they learned under a master, they then formed their own ideas and had their own philosophy. Because then you had Aristotle who came out of from, from Plato and he had his own thoughts as well. And they would you, you, they are in conflict with each other in, in a lot of aspects as well. So these people have spent almost like a, a like a lifetime thinking these ideas and and you know running scenarios through their heads to try and work out where they fit in. They're act- and and I think the, the biggest the biggest difference is they're actually trying to find some sort of truth or some sort of some sort of answer in life for real not just not just trying to impress their friends or or whatever else it's like i said about the tattoo thing just to think your ideas through before saying them. except when you come on this show then you just rattle off what's over on the top of your head absolutely (laughs) (laughs) but i'm not a philosopher all i tell people i'm a jackass with a microphone um but mark you've given me enough of your time man this has been an amazing talk i'm gonna get you and steve on i don't know how you feel about that but sounds great. Yeah. We're going to have a Sparta versus Greece rivalry. No, I'm just kidding. But I want to see if you guys, because he's a Sparta guy, he's a Rome guy. And a lot of the stuff that happens in Sparta, I know he's going to evolve his show and everything. It does relate a little bit to Greece too. So, I mean, there's some aspects of it where I'm like, hey, let's try and find some common core principles to it all. Yeah. I mean, me and Steve, uh, a little while ago, we only, we had a, a talk. I think it ran for only two and a half hours just on, on ancient Greece. I know you had it posted on Friday. I listened to it. Yep. <laughs> But But, um, um, yeah, yeah. I think that'd be great. It'd work well. But Mark, where can people find you at, man? Um, So you can either go to my website, which is www.castingthroughancientgreece.com or else I'm on uh, Twitter at casting underscore Greece or on Facebook at casting through ancient Greece. I'll make sure I link it all in the description. And thanks for listening to this episode out of the blank podcast.